Hello, everybody, uh, and welcome. My name is Jan Kampmann, and I'm a professor in this department. So uh, we have, together with the Democratic School, I had the pleasure of, of hosting this arrangement. Uh, anyway, uh, we are happy to welcome you all here uh, at HOOK, and uh, had the pleasure of, of being co-arranger of this uh, very interesting, I hope, <laughs> event. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I too want to welcome all of you. Uh, I'm Rikke Knudsen and I'm one of the co-founders of the Demokratiske Skole here in Roskilde. Uh, our school is the only Sudbury school in Denmark and when Peter Gray talks you'll hear some more about Sudbury Valley School especially. We are modeled after Sudbury Valley School. Peter Gray is a psychologist and researcher and he's researching into um, children's play especially and, uh, and that has led him also to, to research in the Sudbury Valley School and you'll hear more about that. Um, Peter is also writing a very popular blog on something called Psychology Today. It's called Freedom to Learn and uh, I think you should check it out. It's, it's a very nice blog. Before, um, Inviting Peter up, I want to thank the Institute, especially Jan Kampen, for, uh, for the cooperation about this uh, lecture. And uh, also Jimmy Kra and Anas C. Anas. Um, <coughs> Peter, now it's your turn. Okay. <laughs> I just want to have this timer on my <coughs> front of me because the clock is behind me. <laughs> so, um, well, I'm delighted to be here. And thank you all for coming. What a great turnout. This is the uh, first time I have been to Denmark. And despite the fact that the weather is a little bit cloudy and rainy, I'm very impressed, nevertheless, by the beauty of Denmark. Um, I am uh, an evolutionary psychologist, which means that I am interested in human nature. I'm interested in how human nature came about by natural selection, and I'm particularly interested in the nature of human children. Why are children the way they are? Why are they so playful? Why are they so curious? Why are they, why do they behave the way they do? Why do they want to do what they want to do rather than what we want them to do? Why do they drop things on the floor deliberately to watch them smash? Why do they, why are they, why are they the way they are? And they're that way everywhere in the world. And they're that way in every family. And you can't even suppress it. They're just constantly exploring and playing and asking questions. And I would argue learning about the world around them. So, that's the uh, kind of the orientation that I come from. Why is it? Why is it the children are this way? So you've got the handout here. Does everybody have a copy of it? If not, raise your hand and see if it'll be okay. Mm -hmm. The handout, the front page of the handout, um, I should also ask, can everybody hear me all right in the back? No problem, sir. The front page of the handout gives the outline of what I'll be talking about. And the back page of it gives some references for anybody who might want to follow up on any of this. Um, I always feel if I'm going to make some statements that <coughs> might be somewhat counterintuitive to people or might not fit what, with your beliefs, that at least I should give you the opportunity to check out the data. And where's, where is this argument coming from? What are the, what are the findings that I'm referring to, um, if you would like to check it out. So that's the purpose of that back page. If you look at the front page, you see I've divided the talk into three main sections. The first one, titled The Decline of Play and the Rise of Emotional and Social Disorders. All the studies that I'll be referring to there were done in the United States. When I speak elsewhere, most people tell me the same seems to be true in their country as well perhaps not to quite the same extent as in the United States. But do keep in mind that I am talking there about data that comes from the United States. Then on part B, which will kind of be the major part of the talk, <coughs> children are biologically designed to educate themselves through free play and exploration. I'm going to give three lines of evidence for that. Um, 
And then finally, um, at the end, and it will depend on how much time we have um, before I want to stop for questions, um, I will be talking about the optimal context for self-education. What's the context in which children's biological drives and abilities to educate themselves works best? How can we help children um, learn um, in their own natural ways? All right, so the decline of play and the rise of emotional and social disorders. Over the past uh, 50 or 60 years, really over the course of my lifetime, I'm 70, I'll tell you that right at the end, so you kind of know my history. Over the past 60 years, 50 or 60 years, there's been a continuous erosion of children's freedom to play. They're free, and their freedom to play away from adults in their own chosen ways without adult direction. I actually define play as behavior that's self-chosen and self-directed. So if, it's, if there's an adult there telling the kids what to do, it's not play by my definition of play. So that definition of play, play has declined dramatically, especially outdoor play has declined dramatically over that period of time. There's a historian uh, of, uh, uh, in the United States who's written a book a few year, years ago called Children and Play in America. He refers to the first half of the 20th century as the golden age of children's play in America. By 1900, the need for child labor had declined sufficiently that most children had quite a lot of free time. And adults had not yet taken over that free time. So as a result, children had a lot of time to play, a lot of time to be outdoors, away from adults. Um, you know, the common, the common uh, refrain of most uh, mothers was, get out of the house, go outdoors. There wasn't this great concern that somebody was going to snatch you away if you were outdoors not being watched, or that you would be run over by traffic, or that you would get lost or get into some kind of terrible trouble. Of course, everybody recognized you'd get into trouble, but there was some recognition that you would, it wouldn't be terrible trouble and you would figure your way out of it. So I was lucky enough to have grown up at the tail end of, um, of Chudikov's uh, golden <coughs> age and then a child in the 1950s. And, um, when I tell young parents in the United States what my childhood was like, they find it hard to believe. Because if, if a mother today in the United States uh, allowed a child to do what my mother allowed me to do, the mother might be accused of negligence by state <laughs> authorities and certainly would be by the neighbors. But by the time I was Five, I was able to go on my bicycle anywhere in town. And if I went with my six-year-old friend, a little girl who lived across the street, more mature, older, smarter than I, I could go out of town also. I could be, I wasn't quite trusted to go out of town on my bicycle, but if I was with her, I could because she was responsible and mature and would make sure I didn't get into any serious trouble or get lost and not find my way home. We didn't have cell phones, of course, in those days either, so if you did get lost, you couldn't just push a button and have somebody come and get you. Um, by the time I was six, I carried a jackknife. All boys carried knives. I don't know what it's like here in Denmark, but uh, knives are pretty much outlawed for everybody. Certainly, you can't carry them in school anymore. Um, by the time I was nine or ten, I would take all day skating or skiing hikes on the, on the five mile long lake we lived on with my friends and we would carry matches and we would light fires and we would act like we were brave adventurers out in the wilderness. You know, that was what childhood was like and it wasn't, I wasn't unique, this was childhood for a great many, if not the majority of people back in the 1950s. Childhood is nothing like that today. In the 1950s, you could walk out in any neighborhood in the United States and you would see children out there playing on their own without an adult in sight. Now if you walk out into most neighborhoods in the United States, if you see children at all, 
outdoors. They are likely to be wearing uniforms. They're likely to be on some kind of a manicured ball field, playing a game that's directed by adult coaches and, and adult umpires or referees with parents sitting around watching and cheering their dear boys or girls every move. Very hard for kids to get away from adults in this day and age. And this is counted as play today, but by, by definition it's not play for reasons that I may make clear as I go along. So there's been a tremendous decline in, and it's been a continuous decline. It's not that it, it's not like there was some sudden point at which it dropped. There's been a gradual change so that you know it's like the clock hand moving. You don't necessarily see it move. So you don't necessarily see this change from year to year, but over the past 60 years, it has been a huge change. Now, over this same period of time that play, free play has declined in the United States, there has been a continuous, gradual, but overall huge increase in all sorts of childhood psychopathology. And for example, Using standard questionnaire, the, the MMPI, Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, which has been given to normative samples. There's a version of this for, for uh, kids in the range of about 12 to 16, and there are also the adult version that college students take. Uh, given to normative samples of people over the years, in this case since 1938, and what you find is since about, the, about 1960, there has been a continuous rise in the number of children and young adults who would score as suspected major depression using today's criteria on that questionnaire. There had been a five to six fold, uh, or five to eight fold increase in that number. So five to eight times as many young, adults and teenagers would be diagnosed with major depression today as was true in the 1950s. When you look at this data, it's a linear, roughly a linear change. Again, there's no sudden change. The data don't correspond with economic cycles, it doesn't correspond with wars, it doesn't correspond with the divorce rate, it doesn't correspond with anything that you might think might affect how children feel. Similarly, there's a, another scale, the um, the Taylor's Manifest Anxiety Scale that measures uh, uh, anxiety. And there's a version of this for children, and this has been given to adolescents and to uh, even, even to younger children and to adults. And there's a, roughly a five to eight fold increase in uh, what today would be diagnosed as general, general anxi generalized anxiety disorder among young people in the United States. There are whole new disorders, ADHD and so on and so forth, that we didn't even talk about or believe uh, in, in, in the 1950s. Whether or not re these are real disorders, though, is another question. But clearly, anxiety and depression are serious, serious problems. Let me just give you an idea so you can see some of the specific questions. Um, it's hard to find this, you know, the, the average result for particular questions on these questionnaires, but I managed to find one study where they looked at the uh, MMPI scale for uh, depression for uh, children in the 14 to 16 year old range, and there were two big national studies done, one in 1948 and one in 1989, and which the more recent one were more recent than that. But this is still a gap of, what, 41 years between 1948 and 1989. And the, the questions are written in such a way there's a statement and you either agree or disagree with the statement. So let me just read to, to give you a view of this. It's one thing to say they met the cutoff for major depression, but here's the average, how, what percentage said yes to these questions. So here's one question. I wake up fresh and rested most mornings. In 1948, 75% of 14 year olds in the United States said yes to that. So 25% said, no, I don't wake up. By 1989, only 31% said yes to that. 69% were saying, no, I do not wake up fresh and rested most mornings. 
I work under a great deal of tension. In 1948, 16% said they worked under a great deal of tension. By 1989, 42%, these are 14 to 16 year old kids, are saying, yes, I, wait, I, I work under a great deal of tension. Life is a strain for me much of the time. In 1948, 9% agreed with that statement. By 1989, 35% were saying, life is a strain for me much of the time. You know, but imagine, burned out from life, feeling life is a strain for me much of the time, by the time you're 14, 16 years old. I have certainly had more than my share of things to worry about. In 1948, 22% agreed to that. By 1989, 55% agreed to that. I'm afraid I am losing my mind. This is one that blows my mind. 1948, 4% agreed with that. 1989, 23%. Uh, uh, almost a quarter of kids are saying, I am afraid of losing my mind. And the people who do this research tell me that if we had the scores on um, individual questions for more recently, it would be even worse than that because these trends have continued on to today. So we seem to have made a world, at least in the United States, that is stressful and depressing for children, far more so today than it, than it was then. There's another questionnaire called the Internal External Locus of Control Questionnaire. And initially developed by Rotter, uh, which has been given over the years since about 1960. Um, there's a version of that for children, which has been given over the years since uh, probably about 1970. And uh, that also shows that over the course of time, fewer and fewer young people, children and young adults in the United States, feel that they are in control of their own life more and more are responding to the questions in a way that suggests and indicates very clearly, in fact, because the questions are very direct, that they feel that they don't have control over their own fate, that their fate is dependent upon circumstances beyond their control. Now, you know, that's a surprising result in a sense, because in reality, you would think that we would have more control over our lives today than we did in the 1950s. <coughs> You know, in many ways, we've solved the problem of a lot of diseases that were killing people then or crippling people back then that aren't today. We've done away with some of the racial prejudice that we had then, some of the prejudice against women that made women's lives constricted, restricted what women could choose to do or not do. Um, in some ways, you would think that we've made some progress in giving people control over their lives, less determination by fate, and yet, there's been a large change such that children and young adults feel less in control of their lives now than they did back in the 1960s when this test was first start, started to be given. So these are, these are sad findings. One more finding, the results on this are not quite so dramatic and we don't have data over such a long period of time. But in the uh, around 19, late 1970s, um, Scales were developed for assessing narcissism and another scale for assessing empathy in young people. Narcissism, of course, is the, is the over attunement to your own self and your own needs at the expense of caring about other people. And empathy refers to the ability and the tendency to feel other people's emotions, to experience what they're experiencing, and therefore to sympathize with what's happening to them and to want to help them. So in a sense, empathy and narcissism are opposites, although there are these two different scales for assessing them. And what has happened is that ever since those scales have been around, since about 1980, there's been a continuous, um, gradual, not a huge, decline, but a highly statistically significant decline in empathy and increase in narcissism. In other words, people are becoming more and more self-centered and less and less concerned about um, other people. So those are changes that have occurred um, over the course of, uh, largely over the course of my adult life in the United States. Now. Um, for those who don't like questionnaires, um, the suicide rate has 
has quadrupled among children aged 15 and younger in the United States over the course of time from the 1950s until now. Uh, the suicide rate for young people aged 15 to 24 has approximately doubled. The suicide rate for people my age has gone down considerably over this <coughs> period of time. In fact, the suicide rate for middle-aged people is held about the same. So it's young people who are who, for whom the suicide rate has increased. For middle-aged people, it's held about constant over all of this period of time. For us older people, life is getting better. So, um, that, so this is the reality, at least based on statistics um, in the United <coughs> States. Now, so I've described a decrease in play. There's no question about that. I've described an increase in, um, in psychopathology, especially in, in, de in depression and anxiety among young people. Is there a cause-effect relationship between the two? Of course, correlation, any social scientist will tell you, correlation doesn't prove causation. Could be that these are just two trends which are completely independent of one another for some reason. I've tried to search for other kinds of causes, and none of them seem to work, at least from my figure. None of them seem to work. Moreover, it seems quite logical that there would be a cause-effect relationship. Anybody who's studied play, anybody who's studied children, anybody who really knows what makes children happy would expect this correlation to occur. So there's really three reasons here why I, that I think I've listed on the handout, why I believe there's a cause-effect relationship. I'm quite convinced of it. First of all, the correlation is very good. It's a linear decline in play, roughly linear decline in play, and a linear decline, in, uh, a linear increase in, um, in mental disorders, a linear decline in mental health of <coughs> children. So the correlation fits that way. It doesn't correlate with economic cycles, with wars. Uh, as I said, it doesn't even correlate with the, with the divorce rate, which peaked in the 1970s um, in the United States. Uh, the kinds of things that people might come up with that are other social changes, the correlation is not so good. Secondly, um, as I said, everything we know about the value of play would suggest that this correlation <coughs> should occur. First of all, let me say this, in my mind of all the data, the statistics that I just described, that decline in sense of control over your own life is, is a key one for understanding the other phenomena. One thing that clinical psychologists know very well is that if you don't have a sense of control over your own life, that sets you up for anxiety and depression. People who score low on that scale of internal locus of control are much more likely to suffer a mental breakdown of some sort, particularly bouts of depression or bouts of anxiety, than are people who do feel they have a sense of control. It makes sense. If you feel you can't control things, the world is very scary. Anything could happen anytime. Or if something does happen, you don't feel like you have control over that, like you can solve this problem. And you, you may react with anxiety, or you may react with depression, or you may react with both of those at, at once. So that, and so how do children learn to have a sense of control over their life? You know, where is it that they do have control over their own life and can learn how to experience that control? Play is it. Where else is it? There's no place else. And if you deprive children of the opportunity to play without adults controlling what they're doing, then they have no way to learn that I can control things. You know, things can happen. I can get lost and I can find my way out. I can climb that tree and I can survive it. I can, I can get into this argument with my friend and we can get mad at one another and we can settle it. We can figure it out. We can, I can do things. The play, we think of play as childish. But play is where children are practicing being adults. It's where there are no adults meddling with them, so they have to be the adults present. They have to solve the problems. They have to figure out the rules. Think of the difference between an old-fashioned pickup game of, I would say, baseball, because that's the sport I grew up with, uh, and an adult-led little league game. In the old-fashioned game, there's no adults around. 
you've got a bunch of kids with different sizes and abilities, sometimes girls and boys together. You have to make up teams, you have to figure out the field, you have to make the rules to fit the field that you have. You have to decide what's a ball and a strike and what's an automatic out if you hit it over and break a window or someplace where you might break a window. That's a, you know, you've, got to, you've got to do all this negotiation. You spend more time negotiating and arguing out the rules and so on than you do playing. But in the end, which is more important, to learn how to negotiate and make rules and solve problems or to learn how to play baseball? There's a few people who go out and make a living playing baseball, but a very, very few. Little League is a good place to learn baseball, but it's not a good place to learn any of this other stuff because all of the other stuff is taken care of by adults. So when you look at it that way, it's no surprise that the more we put a children under adult direction and the less we allow them to direct their own lives, the more children are going to grow up not feeling like they know how to direct their own lives, like they can't direct their own lives, and that is a scary and depressing situation. Further evidence comes from animal experiments. Um, researchers who study play in animals have developed what they call the emotion regulation theory of play. They don't believe this is the only purpose of play in animals. It's interesting to note that all, essentially all mammals play when they're young. Play is the way that all, that all mammals practice and learn the skills that they need to develop to become adults of their species. Well, essentially all mammals play in risky ways. They play, you know, monkeys will swing in trees playfully where they're high enough up and the branches are far enough apart that they could, they could ma not make it. They could fall. And if they fell, they're high enough up to hurt themselves. Not to kill them, they wouldn't kill themselves. They're not that far up but they're far enough up that they would hurt themselves. Chimpanzees have been observed to play games where they'll drop from a very high branch in a tree and then catch themselves just before they hit the ground. Goat kids play in a way where they romp along cliffs and they leap into the air in ways that make it difficult for them to land. So why do animals play that way? You know, evolutionary researchers who look at that, they say, wouldn't natural selection have weeded that all? I mean, after all, they sometimes hurt themselves, they sometimes, very rarely, but sometimes even kill themselves in such play. Why would that have survived the process of natural selection, let alone been selected for? There must be some advantage to it that outweighs the risk of serious injury or death that comes from it. What might that advantage be? And the theory that they came up with is that the animals are learning not just the physical skills, because they probably could practice those physical skills in safer ways, but they're learning the emotional skills required to deal with emergencies. They are putting themselves deliberately in fear-inducing situations. They're dosing themselves with fear so they learn how to keep their heads as well as their bodies in the face of fear, how to manage, how to adapt effectively in the face of fear. Every creature is going to, at some point in their lives, probably many points in their lives, be in some real danger. And if you lose your head then, if you panic, if you can't, if you if you've never felt that kind of fear before or anything close to it, you're not going to be able to deal with that fearful situation. So that's the idea. And animals are also in their play, putting themselves into situations where they, if we can use this word with animals, get mad at one another, get angry with one another. They do a lot of rough and tumble play fighting. And sometimes in that play fighting, they accidentally hurt one another. And of course, the animal who's been hurt gets mad. You know, you broke the rule. You're just supposed to be play fighting. It looks to me like you actually bit me. And they, and they will get mad. And but because they want to play, they figure out a way to overcome it. So the one who's showing anger, the one who's the other one, will show a play face or a play bow. If it's a dog, it's a play bow. You'll say, oh, it's like, I'm sorry. <laughs> We're just playing here. They learn ways of signaling one another to overcome, and the one who's been angry learns to overcome that anger. So part of the emotion regulation theory, too, is that you're not only learning how to regulate and overcome fear, you're learning how to regulate and overcome anger, which allows you then to interact with others of your kind without so easily getting angry and having fights with them all the time, which would be disruptive to your doing anything in any kind of cooperative way. 
So that's a theory that has come from animal behavior. Well, children, of course, play in all of these ways when they're free. They do a lot of rough and tumble play. Anywhere in the world, they do a lot of rough and tumble play. They climb trees and they do these dangerous things. And we generally try to stop them because we worry about them. But today, we try to stop them much more than we did in the 1950s. In the 1950s, this was all out of sight. Mothers weren't looking on. Uh, nobody was looking on. But the other thing I need to say about this kind of play is that when I say that it's, that, that it's valuable to be exposed to fear and to learn how to control fear, the other thing I really have to say in caution is this has to be in free play. It has to be freely chosen. If somebody else decides, if an adult says, like in a physical education class, I want all the children in the room to climb the rope to the ceiling, for some children that's easy and it's a challenge and they can show off. For other children, that's traumatic. That's, they're not ready for that. They would not choose that. Different children, even if they're the same size, the same strength, apparently, and so on, are very different in the amount of fear that they're ready for. The same thing that is a challenge and a thrill for one would be traumatizing for the other. That's why it has to be free play. It can't be adult directed. When adults get in there, you're interfering with what the child knows that he or she is capable of doing. Natural selection may have preserved risky play, but it also led to brain mechanisms that ensure that children rarely take risks that they can't handle, that they're not ready for. Of course, there are always a few children who are more risk-prone, uh, risk and they may need some caution in learning about how to do it. There are always a few children who hurt themselves over and over again.